Okay, everyone. Um, it's been a long time. It's been a long time. Okay, I won't do that. Marco can sing. I can. Anyways, we're back. Uh, Crypto Wednesdays has been rebooted due to popular and incessant demand and harassment. So I'm very thrilled. I think it's been a year and a half or two years. Well, I'll go back and check at some point uh, to restart Crypto Wednesdays. This is a show where we talk about crypto, blockchain, tech, governance, regulation, science, whatever we feel like. Actually, the name is a little bit of a misnomer, but we just play jazz because that's what we do. Um, we're recording this now. And Marco, it's April 12th, right? In my mental calendar. I think that's right. Uh, my mental calendar matches yours. Excellent. Fantastic. April 12th, 2023, uh, specifically. And we may have guests or audience members pop in and out. We'll see how this goes. You know, we haven't done this for a long time. Oh, we got someone here. And I will, the good thing is I, I'm going to have my good friend Marco. I'll introduce in a second. Um, Oh, it's Anastasia. Fantastic. Okay. We, we already got, we already got some talents. It's great. So the topic for today is decentralizing humanity. What and how? So Marco, you and I have known each other for a long time. I'm going to actually kind of let you introduce yourself, introduce Don and sort of run the conversation and I'll jump in when I feel like it and, and have host privileges. So Marco, please introduce yourself, please introduce your guest and we'll go from there. Thanks, Gordon. Uh, well, I'm glad we're all back because I've missed these uh, Wednesdays. Uh, my name is Marco Annabelli. I've been in the space, uh, the crypto space for eight years now and uh, been in the technology space for, wow, 45 years. Wow. Okay. <clears throat> Longer than Anastasia has been alive, plus a couple of decades. Hi, Anastasia. Good to see you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Happy to have uh, you. Hello, so... audiences. And Mark, it's been a while. Happy to see you. Thanks for jumping on. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I've missed hearing about what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mark, we're glad you guys okay, sounds great. Right. It, it's a pleasure. Oh, yeah, Marco, please continue. All right. So, yeah, basically, uh, I currently spend my time working as a strategist, both uh, at the software level, at systems level, and of course, economics and uh, especially tokenomics uh, world, uh, as well as the creation and optimization of uh, decentralized organizations in general. And this has led me down the path of uh, becoming a bit of a decentralization Nazi, uh, uh, in the sense of saying, uh, sorry, but that's not decentralized. And wait a minute, no, no, that's not decentralized. It's not calling it decentralized. It's not decentralized. Uh, there is a little bit of oxymoron calling yourself a decentralized other N-word, but- Right. <laughs> uh, however, yeah. uh, in my long-winded pursuits of the various uh, things I think would be important to decentralize in our world, um, I've come across the usual stumbling blocks that always pop up on among the naysayers. Well, you can't do that because, and you can't do that because, and that'll never work because. And uh, in that, in those travels, I came across this lovely gentleman uh, who is going to introduce himself right now. Don, please introduce yourself. Uh, hello, my hello. name is Elias Sajrak. Hi, Gordon. Hey, Don, go. Gordon. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, it's my new uh, inflection. Uh, yeah. <laughs> my name is <laughs> my name's Don Harris. Uh, I've been for uh, well, a little over 40 years now. I know my bio says 38, but I've got to get around to updating. Um, I'm Canadian. I've contracted as a private contractor to federal government, um, provincial and uh, municipal government all across Canada. Uh, as well as corporations and SMEs and individuals, all oh, it. Um, I got into the crypto space back, uh, I guess my first brush was at the very end of 2011, um, when I was asked to, by a number of my clients, what's this Bitcoin thing and should I care? And I said, well, I'm glad you came to me because I did study the 4,000 alternative currencies that existed eight years before Bitcoin, mm -hmm. uh, part of this project that I'm working on now. And uh, also studied the five uh, digital attempts at uh, currency uh, before Bitcoin, which all failed for, for different reasons, of course. And um, 
said that, uh, tell you what, I'll study it for two weeks. I'll come back and tell you why it's probably going to be failure number six. Because there was no reason to think no. I spent the entire winter trying to punch holes in it and said to my clients, you might want to get some of this stuff that's going to be big. Um, By the way, Don, yes, I, I hear instead, that just, just real fast. I hear that often. I hear this is a, a, an apocryphal story that keeps on repeating, which is and, and doubter, a doubter reads it and learns it in order to destroy it and ends up being yes. a convert. And it, it's, yeah, it's funny how often it that echoes. Yeah. So it's, um, but you know, that's the, that's the important part is being able to say, okay, this, you know, after I've done a deep dive on it, I'm comfortable with it. Now I can recommend it to others, but, uh, mm -hmm. not doing so until you do that deep dive. And so that's me. And since then I've done a whole bunch of other things. I ran a paragliding school for seven years. I travel the world now on this particular project and that's me in a nutshell, in a nutshell. And uh, well, you, you got awesome. a lot going on. And, and, and Marco, can you introduce the, the theme of today's episode? Well, actually, I'm, yes, I'm, I can. I, Marco, I've, I've known you for a few years now, and you are passionate beyond blockchain and crypto. You seem to have a deep philosophical and political, semi-political bent to you. And this is this is a typical Marco sort of, of topic. So can you lay? Can you set the table for us? Sure. Um, I've been a problem solver. That's my, my, I mean, call me an engineer, I guess, in a way, but not any specific type of engineer. I, I, I see things and I go, well, wait a minute. No, we could do that so much better. Uh, or I'm put into a situation and someone says, I, I have this problem. How do I solve it? And I, I look at it and I, you know, a lot of the times I sort of stand back and go, well, you just do this. And they're like, wow, you're a genius. And I'm like, no, I just took three steps back and took a bit different look at it. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the thing is, is that as you go through life doing that, and I've been doing that for 45 plus years, um, you start to realize that a lot of these problems are just little problems, right? And they're, they, they become easy and therefore boring uh, to solve. Um, and of course, I don't stand boredom. Boredom is the, you know, the end of life, basically. When you're bored, you're done. Um, is that air, airplane going by bothering you guys? Not until you said anything. Oh, excellent. Okay. Um, a lot of private jets coming in and out of here. It's weird. Um, I, 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 wait, wait, yeah, Marco, where are you for our audience? I'm, I'm in the Cayman Islands. That's a flex. Almost <laughs> as much as a flex as saying you're in Dubai, but that's okay. Cool. Yeah, um, yeah we've got much more uh, hurricane risk here. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, so I, I've started sort of popping myself up a level. Uh, and that leads you to starting to look at big questions that people generally try to ignore, uh, like, why am I here? And what's, what, what, what does all this mean? And why is that that way? And uh, so, yes, you end up being a bit of a philosopher in order to be able to get some of those questions swept out of the way, if you will, without, you know, you just accepting somebody's word for it. Uh, because accepting people's word for it invariably ends up in a form of slavery. Um, and I've gone through that path and over the last uh, four years, almost five, uh, being asked to solve things like uh, decentralized monetary systems, decentralized identity, um, build a DAO. Um, I've been sort of popping up these levels and that's the topic we're talking about today is what are, at, at the very highest level, what are we actually talking about when we talk about decentralization? Why would we want to do it? And how would we accomplish it given the fact that we all are well aware of, you know, the animal we are and the fact that there's 8 billion of us on this planet and coordinating 8 billion animals is, requires a lot of sheepdogs. <laughs> interesting now you know you, you didn't you didn't by the way you didn't just call it decentralization what and how you called it decentralizing humanity what and how uh, explain that slant please uh it's because decentralization uh yeah yes you can represent decentralization in software for example mm -hmm. or you could call the internet decentralized and it was when it started um it isn't anymore 
Um, you could say blockchain is decentralized. It's decent, more decentralized than um, SQL Server. Yes, um, but it is not decentralized. And this is one of the sort of the things that you when you pop up a level and pop up a level and you start looking at things from a start with a philosophical basis and then drill down, you start to realize things like uh, most DAOs or decentralized platforms of any kind out there are decentralizing, but they're not decentralized. That's a God, that, okay. I'm making a mental put another. I want to talk about DAOs and decentralizing. But go go ahead. Yeah, I mean, this is what, what this uh, this little short slide deck I have here uh, is uh, about. Is just going to mm -hmm. walk through that little that little those little points that should act as the foundation when anybody's walking around looking at anything mm -hmm. uh, to do with decent. The word decentralized comes up. They okay. should be looking at it from this perspective and then saying, okay, so it's kind of okay. Where are the holes in that? Because the holes are where the problems are. Mm -hmm. Now, l l let me ask you a question before you go on. Uh, is decentralization or decentralized an assumed good in your book? Or no, it's a good? thing. Is what? It is a thing. It's like okay. saying, is air good? Right? Does it is tend the towards, sun good? Does it tend towards the good? It, it, it can tend towards the good and it can tend towards the bad. Now, the lovely thing about decentralization in general is that the bad isn't nuclear war. <laughs> the bad of decentralization is paralysis. Yes, as we see in some DAOs, some, some of which we might know. Most, most. I, I would argue, most most fall into the paralysis side. Okay, uh, and again, that, that that comes partially in with the how, which is what Don has a beautiful solution for. Um, and, and but you also have to stop at the what and say why are we doing it? Right? What are we decentralizing and why does decentralizing it make sense? Because it doesn't make sense to decentralize everything. It really doesn't. Okay, so... so you know, a genius get, chemist let's get, let's does get not need to tax. decentralize his talent. <laughs> Again? A genius chemist should not decentralize himself. No. And hey, Sergey, good, good to see you. Happy to see your face. Um, okay, fair enough. So... Is there a manifesto element that you would like to articulate? Uh, we could call it a manifesto, I suppose. But uh, yeah, throw me the throw me the screen, and I'm just gonna go through a little. All right, guys. Now here. I haven't done this for a long time, so just bear with me here. Uh, is it? Did I make you the hosts? That works. Or allow me to screen share. All right, I think under security, I do allow participants to screen share. Okay. Try it. There we go. All right. Uh, right. I'm out of practice, man. Uh, no problem. All right. Uh, all right. We're just going to go there. Uh, uh, PowerPoint. Where's I guess PowerPoint? I'm happy to see you. It's been a long time. So I'm waving at you, Mr. Ozrak Kagila. Hi, guys. Actually, I had a couple of, uh, you know, very specific question. I'm not sure if it is related to the... Well, uh, hold, hold on for the moment. Let's get through the main chunk, but don't don't leave. Huh. All right. We're, we're, there is guest participation on this show, so I, I just want to acknowledge it because it's been a long time. Oh, and you know, oh, and by the way, I have to allow uh, Elias had like a, an amazing uh, Shashlik barbecue about 15 years ago. <laughs> like, yeah. epic. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, it was really good. I still remember that. that. That guy hooked me up. That hooked me on a trash leak. Okay, gosh. Yes. Marco, are you doing this on your phone? I am doing this on my phone because it's a worthy, worthy thing. Okay, let's give this a shot. Okay. And present. Oh, that's interesting. I haven't mm -hmm. seen that before, but okay. Can you see it? It says starting a slideshow. Yes, sir. And and I got a great well, screen. That's... Yeah, I'm screen sharing, but for some reason, well, I I can see, I can see your battery, I can see your 
Okay, here we Signal go. Signal strength. I'm just going to go with this. Oh, no, there you go. This okay, maybe work. that's good. A seven-minute tease. You're always teasing. Yes. Okay, so let's just – we're going to blow through this very quickly. I did this in Davos. I tried to do it in seven minutes, but there were a lot of uh, uh, queried faces uh, that, that caused me to stop on certain things. So I'm just going to try to plow through this so we don't take up too much time. We can get down to the meat of the Q&A session, which is always the best part. Yeah. Um, so and Don. what is decent – what is decentralization? It is very simply removing all centers. Keywords here are all centers. So you might have a community of 10,000 people, um, but there might be, say, a quarter of them collectively hold more than a quarter of the voting weight. Mm -hmm. That is not decentralized. There is a center. It is not a, it is not a majority center, but it is still a center. So decentralization, or rather, decentralization is the removing of all centers. Now, most of these are verbs, removing, right? Not removed. When you've got them all removed, now you are decentralized. Okay. That, I, I get it. Right. So decentralizing the autonomous organization. Decentralization, are, you're, you're highlighting the difference between the process of decentralization and the result of being decentralized. Correct. Okay, fine. Interesting. Right. Uh, to be fair, a DAO, DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization, sure. uh, which should theoretically mean there are no centers. In other words, everyone's all actors within a system have equal control over the configuration of that system. Okay, keep going. The emphasis on equal. The, no, one's, no one's smarter, richer, uh, better or more popular than anybody else with respect to governing power. And the other piece that to be very careful of is that distributed is not decentralized. There are a lot of places that, that uh, they say they're a DAO, but they're a distributed autonomous organization. And that's not the original uh, ethos of DAO. Distributed just means you've spread it around. It doesn't change how the weighting of governance is done. The original democratic model, right? Thank you, the Greeks, um, was based on that con that concept, and they ran up against all the things that we're going to talk about today. So it's not exactly a new system issue. Uh, the difference is is that the Greeks didn't have an instant form of communication between all peoples individually. We do. Okay. What, de what decentralization is not? If your system is meritocratic, it's not decentralized. If it's plutocratic, it's not decentralized. And if it's delegated, it's not decentralized. I mean, it, Mark, are you implying it, it's, is it a pure democracy either? For one is, person, one? One state? person, one vote, yes. Now, the one is negotiable, shall we say. Or the, which I'm, one? I'm the one, one person or the one vote is negotiable? The one vote is negotiable. Okay. It could be one person, 10 votes. Or it could be one person, 1,000 votes. As long as everyone's got 1,000 votes, it's, it's, it's decentralized. Okay. But if one guy has 1,001 and everyone else has 1,000, okay, the Nakamoto score is like, you know, 17 nines, but it's still not perfect right okay why decentralize decentralized systems and this is not just governance systems this is all possible things you can decentralize are very hard to destroy very hard to corrupt and very easy to repair i'm, I'm curious hopefully you'll expand on that last point Easy to repair? Yeah. If you've got um, 8 billion copies of a thing around the world and a billion of them get wiped out, how hard is it for the 7 billion remaining to replace the billion? What, what if there's a non-malicious but natural bug, say in the government's governance mechanism, that people re then realize that it's there and he needs to build 
a decentralized consensus in terms of fixing it? Do you include that in the third category? No, that would be uh, you. You, if you have a single software platform, then you have centralization. Weed that out. Okay, so I mean, are you does decentralization require not just decentralization internally, but many, 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 many decentralized entities? Uh, well, for example, if you're looking for a decentralized um, consensus mechanism, for example, mm -hmm. then the global consensus agrees on a protocol. But the implementation of that protocol can be done by anybody. And so long as they're complying with the protocol that the collective has decided is the protocols to be used, you do not have centralization of the software being used. Okay, but let me just push on this. So that, that protocol theoretically, I think would be arrived at in a decentralized manner. Is that Correct. Fair okay, what if, what if that protocol includes a mistake, for example, in the governance that no one put in there intentionally, it wasn't like because a bomb went off, but just because it got born that way. And later on you right. realize it, suppose suppose it's fine at a certain so you, point, you but change the protocol. and then something gets revealed. How do you... you change the protocol? Okay, but Collective. our decentralized in a decentralized governance system is that easy to repair? It's easy to repair if you're. I see what you're saying. Okay, okay. I'm thinking about uh, when I say easy to repair, I talk about uh, things that are easy to repair that are external. If your internal has an issue, right? Uh, your internal is actually part of your decentralization. So effectively, you are not decentralized <laughs> until you've fixed the internal so that you are. Okay, well, you, well, look, you know the format of the show. So, you know, it, it, it's no, intense no, debate dialogue. Good. So hold on for a second. So given a, a DAO you and I were both recently involved with, okay, yes. or just some copy of that thing, right? If there was a governance or reputation-based governance system that was flawed from the get-go, hypothetically, okay. right, it was I, I think my personal experience is that it's not easy to repair or fix. Your you're okay. Your experience within that particular organization, yes, yeah, I agree with you, one hundred percent. Not easy to fix, but that was because there was very little collective desire to make it work. So could it have been, I mean, because I think I think in any grown system, you're gonna have interest groups or interested individuals operating according to their own incentives. I think it's maybe not realistic that everyone's gonna toe the line and when they see a problem, fix it. They might not even see it as a problem. Some people might, but the people some who are people incumbents might, that, the system, that the flaw benefits may fall in love with the flaw. Yes, I totally agree. Uh, we can break down where the flaws were in that whole system. Um, one can argue that the first flaw was face-to-face -face conversation. Maybe. And, anyways, I, I just I just want to tease that one out because that third one caught my eye. But keep on going. Okay. Easier to repair, by the way, not easy necessarily. Okay. <laughs> um. So the major candidates for decentralization, as I see them, um, accountability, which is fundamentally uh, the thing we're trying to accomplish with identity, but we could just bypass identity and go straight to accountability and say, that's what we're actually trying to solve. Mm -hmm. um, monetary system, again, ideal candidate for uh, decentralization, especially given the way the world's going now. Um, or rather, especially since the world is now waking up to the way it's been operating for the last 30, 40 years. Um, obviously, telecommunications needs to be decentralized because control of communications in, in a centralized manner is obviously dangerous to society. Mm -hmm. uh, energy generation. Same problem. Centralized energy generation creates a power base. In fact, one could argue that our current global economic system is literally oil-based. 
everything derives from oil. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, manufacturing. Manufacturing should be much more decentralized than it currently is. Supply chains alone are, are a problem uh, because they create situations where, you know, one country's got a pandemic and all of a sudden the rest of the world is not able to get a particular product. All right, so I, I, I'm going to jump in again because I remember having this, this debate or discussion before. There's some, in my mind, there's some infrastructure type projects that can't be crowdsourced or crowd developed or done incrementally or we'll figure it out as, we'll figure it out as we go along for example a railway system or a nuclear power plant or a dam or an airport the those things are complex and large from the start i don't necessarily disagree with i think there's roles for decentralization with all this stuff but i think that complete or majority decentralization maybe doesn't fit here Complete? No, you can't do complete. But this is back to the realities of our existence, right? Mm -hmm. Rare earth metals are not available everywhere. Okay, so you you know, does this model wherever they work are. for building airports? This model would uh, not work for building an airport. Would it but work for one? Can one can argue that by doing by decentralizing these five things. Mm -hmm. airports would probably become unnecessary. That's very hopeful. <laughs> Are, would, would long distance travel become unnecessary or you're saying there's another no, way to get no. there? Long distance travel would be, you know, the way you get from A to B, but, you know, instead of having a uh, internal combustion engine car, you'd have Evil. either a single vehicle or multiple vehicles, one for air, one for water, one for land. Uh, all of them self-generating energy that allows them to basically have uh, unlimited autonomy. And then I'm not sure we're there yet, but okay, keep going, keep going. We're, okay, you know, dude, we're not there yet, but we're very close to being, having the technological capabilities to be there. Okay, the I'll, I'll, I'll is, take it as given. Does, does the world want it? <laughs> which is uh kind of we get down here to this last slide mm. <laughs> we're not ready not socially not philosophically or intellectually uh, it's interesting you, you didn't say you didn't you did not say humanity isn't ready technologically did you mean no to? i didn't don't need to mm -hmm. we are actually at that point technologically speaking where we can accomplish all five of those <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Uh, you know, obviously transition time would vary uh, from, you know, current systems to uh, something like that, but it is possible. Um, the key part here was that the solutions for accountability in the monetary system uh, require Don. <laughs> and his model for how you go through the governance process uh, in order to make this work. The telecommunications and energy generation ones are largely not software. They're hardware that you can already build today mm -hmm. uh, that would effectively render energy and telecommunications fully decentralized. Well, we can talk about that after... I let Don go through his his piece, which is you know the how you you accomplish large scale. Um, but fundamentally, the the key for this whole thing is that every individual is responsible and accountable for everything they do. Everything they do. That's a very very big concept. But when you get to that point where you've got a place where that accountability infrastructure is there. <laughs> All of a sudden, you will now see the monetary system becomes a cakewalk. And telecom and energy, well, they're already here, but now you will have the will of the collective to make sure that they get it, they get actually implemented, because there's a lot of resistance to implementing something that basically undoes things like utilities. And uh, Don, Don and I worked out this last quote together yesterday, uh, just because the former one was interesting, but you know. Uh, 
delegation, which is what everyone wants to do. Okay? They all want to delegate their decision making to that smart guy over there, or they, they've invested in something and they want to delegate their, uh, uh, their control over that investment to some other guy over there. Uh, delegation is the will is, is willfully subjecting yourself to the will of another. Uh, it is in fact, self enslavement. Okay. And we're good with it. We're all good with it because it's easier. Right. But then we bitch and we complain because we don't like what we enslaved ourselves to. You're the going against that, conventional management wisdom of delegation is genius. And if you try to do everything yourself. Everybody should do everything themselves, own what they're doing themselves. That doesn't mean you don't do jobs for other people who want things done. Mm -hmm. But you don't delegate the decision to do that job to somebody else. You keep that decision to yourself. That's your choice to do that job. Interesting. Right. Interesting. Collective action, uh, you know, like the corporate structure, the hierarchical model for teams accomplishing things in highly effective ways. There's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing. And should you decentralize the innovative, you know, the garage team concept? God, no. Because it works. It accelerates innovation. It provides many things to the world to, you know, improve itself. Now, when it comes down to, is this a good idea for us to do this uh, or to adopt this globally? That's something where you want everybody's opinion on the, on the topic. And a reasonable proportion of humanity, shall we say, should be making the decisions on whether or not to expend so much resources to, uh, you know, put a, uh, a bunch of humans on Mars, for example. Mm. right that's a more general one you know, but how do you put them on mars yeah don't ask the general population to come up with that answer that's not what they want to be doing get experts to do that and let them operate in whatever team structure makes them comfortable but anyway that was a question that let's let don uh, cover the the piece because don's don has Please. a model that absolutely is brilliant for handling the Biggest problem that you saw, uh, Gordon, in that DAO that we've worked on together um, and is generally the biggest problem we face, which is not everybody understands every question put to them. How do you get around that? All right, so Mark, I'm, I'm going to pause you. Very interesting. Don, take over. And then actually, Mark, I want you to stop sharing your screen just so Don gets maximized. <clears throat> Certainly. And uh, if I could share my screen out, that would be sure. good. Not sure how to not share. Oh, <laughs> uh, right well, now. Uh, have a button for that. My Zoom. Stop share. There we go. Found it. Fantastic. Oh my God. Look at everyone's big faces. All right, Don, go for it. Okay. I'm just going to. I, mean, I missed the... this group. By, by the way, guys, just real fast, if you stick, I'm sticking with this. And if you stick with this about four weeks from now, four episodes from now, you're going to see rows upon rows of participants. We got to that point the last time we did this. It's amazing how this time goes fractal. So at that point, I think we're going to have to have a revisit by Marco and Don because they, you know, the first one through the wall is always, got the, you know, got the flat forehead. But it, it's nice to see, you know, even now after a year and a half or two years, we got people. I, I thought it was just going to be me and, and the bandstand. So I'm appreciative what did everyone the, who showed up. What it's did the nice. fish say when he swam into the wall? Yep. Oh, and Dr. Dell's coming on. That's fantastic. Damn. Yeah. So right, we got to say hi to Dr. Dell. Of this course this we do. is the community part Hello. of this, which makes me happy. Hey, Dr. Dell. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, or good afternoon, wherever you are. Okay. Uh, put yourself on mute, but I'm glad you're here. We're going to have you participate a little bit later. So, uh, okay. Don, go ahead. And you may want to minimize my smiling yeah. face. <laughs> we'll get there. Ah, damn. Thank you. Just oh my damn. god. Damn. This one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Now you got my smiling face. It's That's better. better. Hey, everyone oh, mute yourselves dear. except for Don. Hang on. Okay. I wants to do the whole screen. Hang on. I'm gonna just stop sharing for a second here. Do you have that slideshow handy by chance? No. 
I'm gonna right. see if I can. Sorry, I was muted. It. It's in the channel. It's on the April twelfth channel. Yeah, let me get it. Let me get it from here. Uh, yeah. There we go. There we go. You got so many weird yeah. people following me on Instagram. You know, new profile. Okay, we're here. today. Okay, I'll mute myself. Here we go. Okay, we're good. Okay, welcome. Um, this uh, project uh, has the name Philosopher Democracies. It's uh, that name is a specific, uh, specifically directed to the idea of the philosopher king by Plato in the Republic. Uh, Plato's idea of the philosopher king is actually a reasonable idea uh, on paper. It's fantastic. But the problem is, is that it relies on a on a system of hierarchy. It relies on the king. And, that, and that's the central point of failure. So what I realized is long term, that's not going to work. I mean, the king could be assassinated, could go insane, but all sorts of things could go wrong with the king. So the idea was what we needed was not a philosopher king, but a philosophizing population. We needed the entire population to provide the checks and balances of the system instead of a single point. So that's why it's called Philosopher of Democracies, and I'm hijacking the term PhD because I can. <laughs> and I think it's actually important because the term PhD has lost its meaning quite a bit. We've seen a lot of PhDs fail us very badly in the last three years. I think we need to hijack it as a species and we need to use it for ourselves because we need to be wiser. Now, let's go to that point of wisdom. And this quote, I think, is vitally important to that. And it really under under uh, structures the entire concept. And this is by Osho, by the way. It says, no society wants you to become wise. It is against the investment of all societies. If people are wise, they cannot be exploited. If they are intelligent, they cannot be subjugated. They cannot be forced in a mechanical life to live like robots. They will have the fragrant fragrance of rebellion around them. In fact, a wise person, a wise man, is a fire alive, a flame. He would rather to die than be enslaved. Wisdom is vital, and we live in societies, as this quote shows and specifies, we live in societies that don't encourage wisdom at all. There's nothing in our society that that focuses on making people wiser. That's left up to us. We have to do it for ourselves. So therefore, in order for us to do it, we need a process. Wisdom is powerful, but what is wisdom? Uh, I've looked at numerous definitions for wisdom. The best definition I've ever found said that wisdom is a human trait composed of two parts, two components. The first component is insatiable curiosity. A wise person wants to learn and learn and learn and keep learning. But that is not a definition in and of itself for wisdom because that also describes intellectualism. Intellectuals also want to learn and learn and learn. But there's lots of intellectuals who are not wise. So therefore, it's only half of the formula. The other half is the really important half. The other part of the trade is humility, it's humbleness. A wise person says, even though I'm learning tons of information and I want to keep learning more information, I have to be careful. I have to be careful because any piece of information I have can be wrong and it could be shown to be wrong as I'm learning. So I always have to reflect, review, and consider the chance that I have to change my point of view. So what we need to do if we're going to get large scale populations to become wiser, which we absolutely need to do. And in fact, it was Eric Weinstein who uh, quoted it very well. He said that we are gods, humanity, we are gods. We create, we destroy, but for the wisdom, we are missing the wisdom. So let's get to the wisdom. Well, if that process is to learn a lot and also be humble about it. To do that for the masses, we need to be able to get them to that point. Now, the truth is we live in a society not of wisdom, 
but of opinion. Every platform we have, whether it be social media, mass media, uh, academies, everything is all about opinion. And when we call for a referendum, when the government wants to say that it wants to consult the people, it says, well, let's have a referendum. And what does it do? Well, it just asks for everybody's opinion and vote on that opinion. And that's why voting alone will never solve anything, because it's always based on bashing opinions back and forth. So these are all just arena, arenas of opinion, and we need to get people past that. Now, this is where uh, a, an excellent psychological study called the Dunning-Kruger effect comes into play. Dunning and Kruger uh, tested a number of uh, people after they taught them on a subject for, I can't remember the exact numbers, but let's say it's about half an hour. Teach a group of people off the street for about half an hour and on a, on a particular subject. And then you test them and ask them how much they think they know about that subject. And most people responded as being 80 or 90% of the subject. And then they would bring them back and teach them for multiple hours, three, four, five hours, whatever. And then test them again and ask them, how much do you think you know now on the subject? And they would say, maybe 20, maybe 30%, even though they had spent multiple hours additionally learning about the subject. So what happened in that process is humbleness crept in. They went from an opinion status of, now I know so much about this, to I have to be really careful because obviously I don't. And so now you've, you've broken that opinion barrier. And that's what any system needs to do if we're really going to break, make the population wiser. Now, 30 years ago, I asked myself a question I couldn't answer, and I love questions I can't answer because I have to do the deep dive. And the question was, why as a species can we not solve our fundamental problem? Why do we keep repeating poverty and equity and conflict and all the other problems over and over and over again? And the sorry, premise Don, is do, do, that... do me a favor. I, I, I actually missed the question. Can you say that again, please? Oh, sorry. The question was, why as a species can we not solve our fundamental problems? Because we keep repeating those problems over and over and over again. Okay, we don't solve them. We put band-aids all over them, but we don't solve them. And so as a species, we're not fundamentally stupid. We do stupid stuff all the time, fully grant that, but we're not fundamentally stupid. We do incredibly complex things on a regular basis. So what are we missing? Something's going on there that, that's not jiving. And for me, that was a 10-year study. I followed every problem I could to its source, to the source of the source, and the source of the source of the source. And when I followed all those problems to their sources, every single problem came down to two fundamental problems. They were, number one, the debt-based monetary system, where we create every unit of currency with a debt in all of our monetary systems around the world. That's insane, because you never have a single unit of currency that's free enough to pay the debt, because they all come with their own debt. That's a hole you can never fill. That causes... Uh, the conflicts, the, the pitting against each other of each other. We're always fighting for dollars because there's not enough dollars in the system. The debt always outweighs the dollar. That's an insane system. So that has to be changed. And so I studied the alternatives to that, and all of them came under the concept of credit-based monetary systems. That just means you just create currency without debt. That's all. It's really, really simple. So I, at that point, I studied the 4,000 existing alternative currencies worldwide to see how we could use those. I actually even tried to implement two of them on Vancouver Island, living at the time. But I ultimately collapsed the project because those projects, um, we realized that we couldn't secure the money hard enough. Uh, even though there were 4,000 of them relatively unsecured, Mm. Uh, they existed, they ran, but I felt the responsibility that if we create a currency, we're, we're playing with people's lives. And I wasn't interested in doing that. So I said, let's, let's step back. Let's wait till we can find a way to secure this better. Um, and then we'll come back and revisit. And I did, we didn't know anything about cryptography at this moment. So that wasn't even a, a part of it. What, what, but what lo and behold, uh, this was eight years before Bitcoin. 
So uh, Bitcoin uh, twenty uh, sorry tw two thousand nine. Yes. So eight years two thousand and one around that area two thousand two somewhere around there. So anyway, so, so that's it's definitely back. an OG move. And am, am I tip of the hat to you? <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, I just said I I just didn't want we were there to help people, not hurt people. And uh, honestly, I really wish some of the twenty thousand altcoins that are out there would realize that that they're hurting people every single day. Um, but that's a whole other story. Let's go back to the important parts. So then Bitcoin comes along. Bitcoin actually solves 80% of that problem. Here's a credit-based monetary system uh, that now has gone global, which is brilliant. It's still you know, on its adoption path, but uh, that adoption rate is increasing and that's fantastic. But we haven't hit our hockey stick move yet. We're still waiting for that to happen. We didn't solve the last 20%. And that is who creates it, right? Who creates it and how is it distributed? Because how all of these 20,000 altcoins, including Bitcoin, were created by either individual... Sorry about that, loud cars. Um, they were either created by individuals, companies, corporations, or uh, organizations. And really, that's not who should be creating the money. The money needs to be created by us. It needs to be created by the communities because that's where productivity is. And money is supposed to be nothing more than a way of tracking productivity. That's a different discussion. We'll come to that. But that is the first problem. What Bitcoin did give us is it gave us the recipe to solve the last 20%. So we're way ahead of the game. This is a very good thing but we still need to solve that last 20%. Well, let's go into the second problem. And the second problem, I think, is going to help us enormously in solving that last 20% of the first problem. The second biggest problem was hierarchical governance. governance the idea that we need leaders and politicians when we absolutely do not. Um, I understand that people like that, as, we, as uh, Marco kept saying that... Uh, it's about uh, the dangerous delegation, but delegation is convenient, but delegation, of course, is dangerous. And we all know that. We've seen that over and over again. And in fact, hierarchical governance, governments around the world, including ours, have extinguished the lives of over 200 million people in the last century. And that's not even counting wars. And that's just unacceptable. So it's obviously a format that doesn't work long term, and we really get to address it. So the answer to hierarchical governance is pretty right, simple. Don, you know, it, it, it's, just, it's just the style of the show. I got to interrupt you because I, I, I'm going to question Certainly. something just so you can Certainly. push back. So, sure. yes, hierarchical government has been certainly responsible for mass death. But I wonder if we would have gotten to 8 billion humans on the planet without hierarchical government. With Maybe without government, we'd be stuck at 100 million because we couldn't have agriculture get around the world in nice convenient ways or patents on medicine or a million other things so how do you how do you do you acknowledge that argument and how do you factor in the lives that are allowed by government uh because uh, we've had non-hierarchical governments that were quite effective even they do and can scale the problem is is that often we tend to submit uh, as a species we tend to submit to authority uh, it's one of our internal uh, meaning. Uh, so we just tend to think that that tends to be the only way, but there's no reason actually that hierarchical governance was required in order to do all of the things that we've done. We could easily have done that. So uh, is, is, there a, a, sorry, is there a present or historical example of a large population surviving and in, in governing itself in a non-hierarchical manner that you can point to? Uh, Aborigin most of Aboriginals them... in uh, North America. Yeah. Right, I, okay. I'm talking about with population yeah, density. Absolutely. Remember, I'm not saying we can't all be happy. I'm just saying that when, to achieve, po since we've got 8 billion more or less people on the planet, I, didn't, I think actually it's more, I can't remember. You know, I, I'm, I'm allowing for the possibility that those life, that scale of life was enabled through hierarchical government as well. And yes, you can have you can have you know Native Americans on the plane, and sure, but you know when you when you start getting to cities and that kind of density, how, do we have any historical example of a large population mass that did not have hierarchical government? 
Well, I mean, okay, you, you so... could argue that hierarchical was actually caused or caused cities to happen. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think it's the interactive effect. But let, let me ask Don: Is it just? I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying, saying it's wrong. I'm just trying to reference it. In my, I'm trying to place it in, right. idea in my brain. Is, is there an example? So of... the good. So the fact that we can have non-hierarchical systems on very large scales today means that it could have happened. Now, be aware that because we've kind of fallen in love and have been kind of pushed a lot towards hierarchical hierarchical governance systems. Uh, as we've been growing rapidly, we tend to think that's all there is, right? So yes, it's harder to say, no, we don't have a, a direct example of a billion people. We only have one planet. We've only done this one experiment with hierarchical governance. And so we, we tend to think just because of that, uh, it can't happen. I have to disagree vehemently. If, if it's happened on small and medium scales, it can happen on large scales. It's all about the format and the implementation. So that's where we're going to go through the rest of this uh, process. And you'll see how you can apply this on any level um, at scale. All right, now let, let, me, so, let me ask and then I'll, I'll pass it back to you. Yes. Are you saying it was always possible or now technology and other tools think, to the point where it's now it, possible? I still think... I still think it was always possible. It's just that we have this leaning towards not doing it. So it hasn't been done on on the large scale that you're asking for. Okay, uh, go ahead. Yeah, because we only really exploded our populations dramatically in the last couple hundred years, right? Uh, it can certainly have been done earlier, but there wasn't really a need to, and we tended to explode because hierarchy tends to need that that power, that engine to drive itself, right? Hierarchy is always about control. And when you have control, you want to increase that control so you want to increase the population as much as possible. And then you want to tap that when it hits a level that uh, it becomes a little a bit unmanageable for the hierarchy. So then it tends to kill its, uh, its populations off pretty darn quick. It, it, in so many ways, this is not a good system. But... We'll continue this, and then maybe we can visit this question again. Okay, yeah, Don, if we can, we can try to get through the mechanics of PhD <clears throat> yes. quickly, so we okay. can get to Q and A. Yes. Yes. Being trashy, okay. unhappy, and not looking after myself. Honestly, I was really unhappy. Is there but someone? Why are we getting an ad? Huh? I don't know why we're doing it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to mute. Can't I'll buy that there. for a dollar. <laughs> who, who do we got here? Is that Elias? Okay. I, I'm just going to mute random people just to make sure we're okay. Okay. All right. Uh, I think we're okay. Don, go ahead. Okay. So what we need is political autonomy. Uh, we need wisdom-based uh, environments that take us through that process. Uh, we need to make united decisions, but with a decentralized system. And that system has to be transparent, clear, and fully participatory. Well, here's the process, by the way. Now, here's the process that takes it, takes people through from an opinion-based solution to or opinion-based perspective to a wise a wisdom-based perspective. Now, the way we do this is we do it with a randomly selected group. At scale, and, and in order to scale, you can't just shove a million people. Let's take uh, an entire city. I'm, uh, let's say I was in Puerto Rico, I was in San Juan, San Juan's interested in using this process. They have a million people in San Juan. So you're not going to take a million people and put them through this process. It just won't, won't be feasible. But what you can do is you start by random selection or what's known as sortition. Sortition allows you to take a good sample of the population, not too small, should be at least 50 to say 150 people, not too big because you still want to make it manageable. But you want to get a nice cross section of voices of the community. That's why you need at least uh, that minimum. I would say 50 would be the absolute minimum I would want to go. So now that's representative of the community. Now you can take them through the wisdom build building process. So the first step in the process, just like the Dunning-Kruger effect, is to bring in the top experts on that subject and teach this group to the level, not just teach them, but get them to the level where they can speak authoritatively on the subject. 
people, they can defend themselves in public. They can talk to their friends, neighbors. They can talk to uh, uh, the media directly. They can talk to university professors and hold the ground on the subject. That's the level you want to get them to. Because if you get them to that point, I guarantee you are going to make them humble. They are going to see that their original opinions were very, very small in, in the scheme of things. And they had to really learn a lot and get up to speed and to think clearly and logically and know all the facts, figures, and stats on that issue. Once you've taken them through that point, you go into the second phase. And the second phase is open public consultations. Now you ask the entire community if they want to come and speak on this subject. So anyone in the community can speak on it. Anyone in the community had access to all of the expert hearings. So they, they can get to the same information. They're open, they're public, they're documented. Mm -hmm. So now they can speak on that subject and, uh, and challenge the, the discovery group, the randomly selected group on that subject as well. Now, the reason you do that is because experts are very good at expert information, but they don't know community. They don't know the flavor of the community, the details and functioning of the community. So you have to get the community perspective on it. Then you move into phase three, which is deliberations. Now this randomly selected group is arguing the viewpoints based on the expert information and the community information from their own personal perspectives to try to come up with the best solution possible. Now, once they do come up with the best solution, very high quality solution, they do not get to implement. And this is very important because they are a small randomly selected group from the general populace. So just like a politician, they could have been bribed, they could have been cajoled and threatened. They could also have internal biases that don't represent the entire community. So it's important that they only propose the, the solution. And so at that point, once they have the solution, they publish back to the entire community. Once the entire community can get access to the published document and read through it, now you have a referendum. But this referendum is no longer based on opinion because now you've done a wisdom transfer through the published document to the entire population. They now understand the facts, figures. They saw the homework. They could see what, it, what was done. After a clear, transparent, documented, open process, they go to referendum. If they don't accept the proposal, that's probably a good thing because obviously the answer didn't resonate with the community. And so therefore it should be shot down. The issue should go back on the file and another random collective group will take a stab at it. But if it does pass, and this is where it's very powerful. If it passes, not a single politician can stand against it because he's lost his mandate on the subject. So the, the uh, issue stands. And this is how you bypass the political system. So you don't have to overturn the political system. You don't have to have a, a bloody revolution or anything else. All you have to do is have community go through a clear, open, transparent process to make a, a community-wide decision. And this can be in parallel with the existing government. All you're doing is taking this issue off the table for the government, because either the government didn't address it or didn't address it satisfactorily to the community, so the community steps up and deals with it. And so the entire process there from the random selection aspect at the beginning, from issue submission to random selection to the actual process. And then that goes back out to the community and then gets decided on and then gets implemented as a project for the community. You should probably not bother with your presentation. I probably should have mentioned this before, but you're not actually oh, screen sorry. sharing. <laughs> oh, I'm not. Oh, my God. No, no. no, no we're just staring at your oh, fingers yeah, and your yeah, hand and your palm. You're doing and... with your hand. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I feel very bad now. <laughs> no, no, it, uh, it, I don't it, know. It's okay, because I... we're, we're all listening. So, the... okay. so is, 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 I mean, this sounds a bit like a referendum type system. It, might... it, it, ends, it, ends, it ends in a referendum, not begins. See, when a, when a politician calls for a random referendum, Usually they already know what the answer is going to be for the most part. They formulated the question in a very specific way. 
and they start using mass media to manipulate the, the viewpoints and the opinions of the public. Here you have a completely investigative uh, deep dive uh, process for the public so that they can come to a much wiser, high quality decision so that they can understand um, all facets of the issue for the community. And then the community finally decides based on that. So that's not your standard referendum based on opinion at all. And don't forget, Gordon, that uh, this is within the context of decentralized autonomy. So the players in this particular uh, wisdom team, if you if that's a reasonable thing to call it, um, are unknown, right? You, mm -hmm. There's there's no nobody can. Well, I mean, over time, sure they can be discovered, but you're likely not going to be able to discover all of them, and they're all going to go through their deep dive into this uh, whatever the proposal is, and generate a proposal that is consumable by the masses. Uh, and gives the masses enough detail that they can make their informed decision uh, on a proposal without having gone through the wisdom exercise themselves. And that's the key. And no one gets blamed or no one can say, well, it's their fault or whatever else, because everybody's given all the information that's available at the time in a consumable form, and now they can make a decision. They can say it's good or it's bad. What, what's the yeah, checks the and balances the on the consumability? Like, uh, so, the, Go ahead. so the proposal is put out by the uh, discovery group. And since they are a randomly selected group from the uh, population, they speak the population's language. They use their own terms, their own uh, phrasing. It's done. It's not done in governmentees. It's not done in legally. It's done in the language of the people so that it transfers very easily. Interesting. And, and, Sorry, and, what was your question? You, you you may have addressed it, but you know the it's one thing to say it will be in consumable language. It's nothing to ensure that it will be. But maybe you answered the question just now. Well, well the it's goal so, is, is that with with 150 people, for example, mm -hmm. uh, and all of them randomly selected from a broad demographic, and there's whole articles on sortition and how you go about selecting the right mix of people to make sure you've got all possibly uh, attribute uh, all possible attributes of the community being represented is that that group uh, if they see something you know proposed as the draft of the proposal and they don't understand something in it or they look at it and they go well i kind of understand it because i've had this education but i know my grandmother's not going to understand it they get to craft it mm -hmm. internally first in the way that is totally consumable by as many people as possible within their circles, right? And since their circles are widely distributed, you'll get to a, a, a presentation of the proposal that is consumable by everybody, right? For example, a software upgrade that maybe is being proposed for a platform that the, the, the community uses you know, yes, no, not everyone's going to understand software development, but the net effect of that software development upgrade, for whatever reason, can be presented in a way that is consumable by everybody who's going to be using it. Now, when there, some people go through that exercise. Let, let, let me kind of battle test this a little bit. The, when you have complex political entities like a, a country, there's thousands, if not millions, of decisions micro and macro being made all the time mm -hmm. a huge variety right. of topics right you, but here, here's the that? thing so so first of all a couple of ways number one what do we do in our society our society every four years or so we go into a little box put a check mark beside a name and tell that person he has to deal with ten thousand issues and that person says well i can't deal with ten thousand issues so i will deal with maybe five or six and I'll build a football stadium and then I'll get me enough folks for the rest and I can push everything else off. Right? Mm -hmm. the, the truth is we, we have a very badly managed system already, but we have, we have 8 billion core processors on this planet and we don't engage, uh, uh, you know, 99.9% of that, right? That's insane. We mm -hmm. should be engaging all of that. If we have millions of problems, we can engage millions of people, billions of people, 
to address those things. And so by having entire communities do these issues, and they don't have to be one at a time, you could be doing these in parallel. You could be dealing with 15 issues at a time, far mm -hmm. more than most governments can handle. You know, there's another piece of this that we're sort of quasi ignoring, um, and that is that we have a a structure currently that is legislative. Yes. And the legislative side of this whole thing is the shortcut to decision making. We set a law in place and then we only deal with decisions that are clearly against that law or are clearly designed to modify that law. All, everything else just is handled by the law, right? You've delegated that decision-making process to a regulatory infrastructure of some kind. The, well, and it has, we, it has an incentive to just keep adding laws and laws and laws and laws because it makes it more complex, complex and then we always have to look to these people to, to sift through that complexity instead of keeping it simple where most people want simple laws they just want the basics don't kill don't steal <laughs> don't, don't hurt other people That's right all exactly. you're, you're almost making uh, an argument for lawyer i mean against lawyers this terrible well but lawyers are <laughs> to a lawyers in general aren't aren't really required in a fully implemented uh philosophical decentralized democracy um simply because the judgments if you will are evident you don't you don't need interpretation fair enough and if let you me, do let, for whatever let, reason let, let needed, open up you go audience. back this to the good. community and ask them for their judgment all right elias take yourself off mute say hi uh introduce yourself okay uh one thing <laughs> good to see you hello hey uh, go my on. name is um elias Osrak. um i'm known gordon for i don't know 10 years more? More than that, my friend. That was back when it, with with Anna Tikaya, which has got to be fifteen or twenty years ago. Well, I can't keep up with all your girlfriends. <laughs> you don't have to anymore. <laughs> Very good. Gone. Congratulations. Wait, wait, wait. Why do you have to keep up with his girlfriends? That's not. That's not anything. Because I did well for a while, my friend. But now, <laughs> I, uh, and apparently, Elias is the ultimate wingman. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, see, uh, let, let me put it this way: I've got I've, now. I'm highly centralized. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. But I, I was a strong proponent of decentralization before with, in my dating life. And you're well, yeah, Marco and I had a really good discussion you're wearing it on the right hand. Yeah. Huh? Because oh, it's the Russian side. So I'm not and sure the German, you know, what we're talking about. Here, okay, Adios, yes, go. <laughs> All right. So I'm um, basically. Um, I've been working in financial services for all my career, and that will be soon to be forty years. So you know, I'm uh, I looked I'm twenty eight, but with uh, thirty years of experience. <laughs> um, and um, my main work is really creating thematic stock indices, and I've been um, getting very interested in. Uh, cryptocurrencies for some time now and uh, lately extremely interested in tokens as a mean to um, basically monetize some future cash flows but also in other uh, very specific applications for example let's assume uh, education which is a good uh, you know a good so um, with artificial intelligence you can have education. Uh, you can, you know, educate yourself. And the more you educate yourself, and the more you give back to this artificial intelligence, as you bring other subjects to educate other people, you earn tokens, and you can then monetize those tokens. It's um, a little bit um, like. Um, there are websites called Quora, for example, where you yep. you answer to questions and you, you get uh, a little bit of cash. You earn a little bit of cash by answering those questions. It's uh, the same principle, except that it will be made by another more liquid instrument, which is a token. 
Um, so that's uh, that's why you know I came I came to this. Um, I was invited by Gordon to access to this uh, webinar. I was very interested to hear about um, everything you had to say. I had some, you know, um, uh, there are some subjects that were a little bit uh, unexpected to me. Um, I like very much. That, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> I like very much the way you presented the centralization. So that was a very good way, I, I believe. And uh, thank you. And uh, I was, um, you know, for example, um, you know, um, surprised when you said that um, telecommunication and uh, um, energy. energy can be decentralized. So I was wondering, you know, why is it pertinent to this conversation? Uh, well, think about the concept of, uh, so the, that list was in order to be yeah. honest okay. accountability comes first right until you've got individual non-authoritarian accountability you can't do a decentralized monetary system because a monetary system requires that there is trust between counterparties and that trust currently is pseudo provided because I, I do say pseudo provided and anybody who's been paying attention to the news for the last four weeks is well aware that it's a pseudo uh, a, a, a secure system um, so you know this question maybe I should ask you directly to you because I sent uh, uh, a small message directly to Gordon while we were talking have you heard about um, the Oroville experiment in India no. So I, I no. can't host and read messages, but go for it. Explain it. Uh, Oroville is um, a utopian city experiment. It was launched, um, I think, in um, probably uh, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in the Pondere Pondicherry area in India. Uh, it was, um, so you have a, an egalitarian um, uh, community. Where mm -hmm. everybody is equal, um, everybody strives to work for the community, and um, um, is being guided by a higher consciousness, so so to speak. Okay. Uh, in uh, big terms, uh, sure. But it was it was you know very much. I was very much relating all your discussion mm -hmm. about it. To this experiment, so I was very curious to find well, out if you, if you. Well, I will recommend you to have a look at it. At sure. Least. <laughs> uh, I mean, forty years ago, we didn't have the we didn't have the concept of immutability that we now have with Bitcoin, for example. Uh, yes. Forty years ago, we did not have the telecommunications capabilities we currently have today, which creates the instantaneous communication capability that is required. You you cannot conduct uh, governance of a, in a decentralized manner without virtually instant communication capabilities. Marco, um, Marco, uh, I'm sorry. L l let me jump in. That, that's kind of why I was asking the question I was asking. So l l revisit, which is. Is this thing we always could have done? Things change. Yes. Capacity. We, we always could have done this, but because we didn't, right? Mm. We have now structured our society and the way communications occur to be hierarchical and centrally controlled. But I mean, we, we, did, we didn't it, have fiber optic 100 years ago. Didn't need it. Is that, a, is that because of hierarchical government or just because we didn't get there yet? No, hierarchical no, governance no, that's because created of cities. Yeah, but no, hierarchical governance created cities. Centralization created cities. Or, or, or right? cities naturally tend toward centralization. You need a sewage plant. Well, you, 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 cities uh, happened after. I, 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 I would argue that's the... an iterative, self-reinforcing, self-referencing process. That's sure, but it started a, with, I'm going to follow him. Say again? It started with a bunch of people saying, we're going to follow him. No. And then he I said, let's so. build a building. No, well, I don't think so. Or, 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 or people saying, people attacking us, let's build a wall. 
that too. Uh, I think the, the, the I people think the creation were of, probably centralized. <laughs> the creation of cities well, actually, actually, when agriculture started to uh, exist. And I think uh, that's largely true. Because that, that, that when you when you start having organized agriculture, you allowed population density and specialization. Yeah. But Don, Don, you were going to make a comment. I was just going to say that uh, you know a number. What would generally happen is as you had villages that uh, started to come together, and grow in population. Those uh, people who were because they were hierarchical, they tended to want to get more resources, more power. So they would start uh, forcing a lot of people in the countryside to come into the cities as much as possible because they could concentrate their power in their in their um, workshops, in their factories and the rest of it. So there was a move to push people out of, uh, out of the countryside into cities to create that density because it was more efficient for hierarchical systems. Non-hierarchical systems don't find a real need, uh, need to be hyper-efficient. They don't mind being a little less efficient because it actually works for them. It, it more, there's more of a quality of life when you have a decentralized system. But in a hierarchical system, the quality of life takes uh, subservience to the efficiencies of the system because the hierarchy demands it. I mean, well, we're, we're, uh, kind of, we're talking you, kind of talking about the closing of the commons, also, which is mm -hmm. not primitive times, but you know, in, in England, but this common if land allow me, exploitable by all, um, closed, and then the world. If you allow me to come back to what I was saying about okay, agriculture, go. sure, go ahead. Uh, well, you know, I think that decentralization will happen the way you describe it. The day people don't have to work to earn money to buy food. When food is abundant for everybody, then you can have everything else of so your your system. One would argue that 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 is a derivative of energy. Yeah. It's my yes. It's a good. It's a good point. That's a good point. So I, I want to welcome our Dr. Adele. Dr. Adele. Yes, thank you very much for having me. Multiple demands in your time. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a uh, uh, truly fascinating discussion, and uh, uh, the the only point that I wanted to add is that uh, as uh, as a human race in general, uh, finding a way uh, to uh, uh, have a quantum leap, you know, in, uh, in, in electrons that go around in their orbits, uh, they need a quantum uh, uh, leap. If they don't get the quantum leap, they cannot move from one orbit to the other. So, uh, so our incremental uh, moves are great, but we need to find out how can we uh, change the game, not for a, a specific group of people, but for the uh, entire race that allows us to like really uh, hit that uh, J curve and be able of getting to the next level where you, you are not worried about kind of like your existence per se, but uh, you are worried about the effectiveness uh, of your existence, like the meaning of your existence. What have you accomplished? What can you do at that point in time beyond kind of like securing your your kind of like normal day to day needs? You uh, need to get the entire race right. above yeah. the fourth for the fourth tier of uh, Maslow's hierarchy. Is what you're saying, right? Exactly. Right. Exactly. You got me. And but the, but this is exactly what the philosopher democracy model does. It raises the level of wisdom in the community, so they start examining how their community functions and works to come up with better solutions. Uh, so one of the things I do is I'm a sailor. One of the first things you learn as a sailor is that you're going to be in the middle of the ocean and help is just not coming. You better know how everything on your boat works. Well, we live in a society that says every four years, put a check mark beside a name and fuck off. Go away because we don't need you anymore. Well, no wonder people are lethargic, apathetic. They they just have no need to to learn about their their communities and how they function. But it is our birthright to understand how our communities function. We should all know where our water comes from, where our food comes from, how everything functions. But it shouldn't be drudgery. It should be exciting to learn about that because we participate in directing how that goes. Right. And that's how you raise people to their on their level of hierarchy of needs. 
Now, talking about this quantum leap issue, uh, one of the biggest problems we have are those two issues I said at the beginning, the debt-based monetary system. That causes humanity to fight amongst itself instead of cooperating to develop itself. As long as you have that system, we absolutely are going to be constantly chasing our, our tails, chasing paper, and being against each other. So if communities start using this process or similar based processes, by the way, this is not my process. I don't own it. It's open source. Anybody can use it. I don't charge for this stuff because I can't charge for this stuff. This is for anybody to use, and it has been used, by the way, uh, all around the world. Uh, all I did was I took pieces that already work, are already functioning, have incredible effectiveness, really change average everyday people into apathetic people, from apathetic people to people who are really engaged. I saw this up close. Um, I'm uh, happy to discuss that, but that's a, you know, uh, I just want to finish this comment that basically if we really are going to take that quantum leap, it's about engaging the population to become wiser, to become self-sufficient, and to throw off the change of the debt by chains of the debt-based monetary system and hierarchical governance. Sorry, Leonardo, is there, Don, is there a white paper or book or guide to... Yes, and, and so is there a place where you put links and stuff uh, up for each of your podcasts? Yes. Okay, good. Then we'll just put in links. <laughs> okay, okay, good. Yeah, that, yes, yeah. I, I, I post this. This can go up on perfect. YouTube, and I'll have links, and then I'll, I'll put it on Facebook and groups and everything. Perfect. Wonderful. <clears throat> Yeah. So yes, you, there's, you've been been paper, there's a slide deck and all of it. You're yeah. alive. Go ahead and ask. Mark, Mark, yeah, do you want to and uh, he wants to ask a question too. <laughs> yeah. So let's let him yeah, ask. Yeah, I, I've got I've got excited people in the background. Oh, by the way, happy to see um, you. It's been a while. It's it's Easter holidays. Um, so you know, I, I'm part of a project called Hubtropolis, which is which is more of a think tank at the moment. But obviously, we've we've turned. We've been thinking about similar ideas. Hubtropolis is about building a city that kind of represents the, the best of what humanity can offer at the moment. So we thought about, you know, trying to align governance. Um, now we've come to slightly different solutions. So for instance, the way we do it is we, we would have some form of hierarchy, but we would have some form of sortation too. Um, so there'd be some people selected, some people elected based upon the Dunbar number. So everyone could uh, effectively know uh, a member of parliament. So mm. kind of a, a more direct democracy where you could get closer in touch with the people who represented you. Uh, and then people would be elected from there to another chamber and another chamber. Um, so so we would have a hierarchy, but, but what we do is the effectively the city would be owned and governed um governed by this body that was elected from the people of the city city or selected from the people of the city they'd undergo an education program again much like you suggested um everyone would have the chance to deliberate on decisions and that would all be recorded and that entire deliberation there's a guy called dr mark klein at mit who um works on large-scale deliberation and collaboration mm -hmm. systems. He's got some very interesting stuff that you might want to look at. Uh, um, actually, Mark, if, if you want to give us some, if you want to shoot me some links, I'll include it in the show description also. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Um, uh, and, then, and then the deliberations of kind of the public would be recorded and the politicians, they can come to a different opinion but obviously they have to note down what they think the impact of their opinion would be compared to what the deliberations of the public mm -hmm. suggested. So then you can go back and you can compare why they made that decision if they rejected the advice of the public and did it turn out the way they thought compared to the way the public thought it was going to go or the experts or whoever contributed because anyone could contribute to the mass deliberation system. So. That, that's one aspect of it. And then the second aspect of it was when it came to voting. Um, now, I understand if you need total decentralization. You're, you're right, Marco, obviously. 
But if if you do have total decentralization, that can lead to a problem where there's kind of the potential for capture. So if people have vast resources and it's one person per vote, then people can try and capture votes by directly paying people outside the system, as maybe happens in some countries in, say, Southeast Asia, where people are voting in blocks the way they're paid to vote. Yeah. Um, so so that's, that's quite a big problem with one person, one vote. Uh, at the moment, we're tending towards kind of a square root kind of idea where people Quadratic vote voting. based upon how much space they earn in the city. And they also get space for being a human individual. Um, but then say you've got a million spaces, you only vote square root of a million thousand. Whereas if you've got a hundred spaces, you vote square root of a hundred, which is 10. Um, so, right. so it brings things back. It, it doesn't eliminate the difference, which tends to kind of work against the idea of regulatory capture and, and people trying to game the system. But, but it, it still has a difference, but it's a difference that's reduced compared to the real world. Mm -hmm. So, so you bring the high end down. So this right. this is the way we've been thinking about it. And then it's because wise, you're talking about voting in the absence of accountability. This is the problem that the, the, why the accountability model is the first thing that has to happen is because without accountability, and I mean accountability at the individual level, public accountability at the individual level, you really can't count on people to do the right thing because there's no penalty for them doing the wrong thing. In an accountability system that is based on fully decentralized accountability where every action you take is recorded and you can't change it. Mark, are you, are you heading towards our reputation different... down model a little bit? It's <laughs> not really reputation. Uh, because it's it's not about whether what you did was right or wrong, good or bad. It's the fact that you did it, right? And that you can no longer deny you did it ever for the rest of your life, that everything you've done is recorded. You're the only one who has access to the net total of everything you've done. But your participation in any collective action opens you to someone querying, well, what's your track record? And you either disclose or you don't. But if you don't disclose, you're excluded. If you do disclose, then people decide, based on your disclosure, whether or not they want to believe your particular opinion or follow your particular way of doing things. And if it shows up in the past that every time there was a vote, 10 bucks showed up in your wallet before you voted. Uh, well, you know, that's paid. kind of, yeah, well, whatever, right? Uh, yeah. But the, the point being is that de decentralized governance requires a methodology that says that every voter is accountable for their vote, not just that they did it, but that they did it in a, you know, coherent and, you know, for the purpose of the vote way, rather than being bought, for example. Now, and of course, you know, when you get to the billion participant world, buying the vote is difficult, right? Uh, and what you're talking about, Mark, is, is something that's a bit of a transition issue, uh, because as you move into this world of fully decentralized governance, the power of any individual or small group of people to buy uh, votes in a way that is disguisable, because it has to be secret, right? The, if the minute people know you're buying the votes, the votes considered not worth doing. If you can't hide the fact that you've bought votes, buying votes is no longer viable. But this does let me to, I gotta, I'm sorry, we're, we're creeping up. On oh, it happens today. No argument. It happens today. Like I said, it's a transition issue going from the old way of doing things where everyone could get away with murder because there was no accountability to the new way of doing things where there's so much accountability that you really have to think twice about doing anything that's even slightly off because you know that, that the record of you doing it will be stuck with you for life. Guys, I'm, I'm going to pause you. We're, uh, we're, like, we're at, our, we're at our, our hour and a half. This deserves a follow-up. I'd, I'd love to see, Don, I, I, Mark, I, I'd love to see this more in action. And Don, I feel like you said it's happened. I think we need a follow-up call or follow-up meeting where times. I can get into the nitty-gritty of that experience. 
and so and wrap our heads around it because it, it's a, it's an interesting world. It's one I feel a natural internal resistance to, but I'm trying to keep an open mind with it because I, I, you know, I'm, I'm from Missouri. Show me. So I, I think I, that's another Absolutely. show. I think I think we need I think we need a show me, and maybe we can even okay. work. Some- yeah. We could do. We could do a show on, uh, I mean, all of these uh, different formats. When I started studying uh, non-hierarchical uh, governance systems, all of the best formats fell under the topic of deliberative democracies. And there's dozens and dozens, of, well, literally hundreds of formats, but uh, all the best ones um, are very powerful. They really change people. While I was studying this, this actually happened in my backyard was instituted uh, in the province of British Columbia, Canada, uh, for the province of 5 million people. So I got to see it up close. I did interviews with the random selectees when they were selected halfway through the process, at the end of the process, and a year later, because they wanted to see if there were lingering effects, uh, lasting effects to the process. Mm. And I also interviewed the chairman of the process, Jack Delaney, who was president of Simon Fraser University at the time. And I also interviewed members of the public, the political class, and the media class. So I got a really close-up view of how powerful that process was. And it took average, everyday people who were at the beginning saying things like, no idea if this would work, never heard about it, thought I'd try it, you know, I, I, I got randomly selected. So, yeah, I'll give it a shot, see what happens to halfway through the process, these people saying, average everyday people, doctors, lawyers, babysitters, unemployed people, very generic people, uh, were saying, oh my God, we were so stunned at, at the level of detail of the issue. We had no idea it was so so detailed. We thought it was just gonna be a simple thing. Uh, we learned so much, we bonded so much, to the point where in the interviews at the uh, year at after the process, I got uh, 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 people saying, you know, because I asked them, how has this affected your life in some way? And they said, yeah, you know, before this process, we used to just come home, feed the family, maybe go out for dessert and and go to bed. And that was it. Rinse, repeat. Uh, After this process, at least two to three times a week, we are out in the community doing things because this process taught us that the only thing way things get done is if we do them. That's it. I mean, that was a complete. I, I, I gotta stop you just for the time. You, you're 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 teasing yeah, my brain on on the next one. So <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop the recording Good. just because I have to. Sorry, guys. You, you're, you're great. So, Marco, Don, for the recording, I'm saying thank you. And oh, you're most welcome. Always enjoy these. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>